Welcome back children. In the previous videos, we were doing lesson number 5. With the video on the exercise problems, I consider that lesson to be over. And in this video, we are taking up a new lesson. Lesson number 6, Electromagnetic Induction. This is a very important lesson, not just for you as 12th grade students. It's a very important lesson for the whole world. Because without the ideas discussed in this lesson, the material prosperity that you see around you wouldn't even exist. The instruments and the equipments that you see around you wouldn't even have been possible without the ideas discussed in this lesson. If Isaac Newton was a person who set the scientific revolution in motion, there were other scientists who contributed immensely time and again to make our lives better and better and better. One such scientist was Michael Faraday. He lived in the 19th century England and his life is a story of hope, human grit and determination. It's a story of not just rising from poverty to lead a comfortable life. It is not even a story of rags to riches. It's a story of rising from extreme hardships to become the greatest scientist of the 19th century, to become one of the greatest benefactors of humanity. As a boy, he was an orphan. Michael Faraday was also a child laborer. He was in abject poverty. But then he went on to become one of the celebrated persons in England in the 19th century. And he contributed, as I said, immensely to science. And his greatest contribution is the idea or the concept or the observation of electromagnetic induction without which the world as we know today wouldn't have been possible. Your fathers studied about him. You study about him. Your children will study about him. And their children will also study about him. As long as there is electricity, there will be Michael Faraday. Generations and generations will come to know about him, read about him, and get inspired by him. I would urge you to read his life story on the internet or even watch a documentary on his life. It's a phenomenal story. It's an inspirational story. It's a story that gives you hope that anything is possible in this world. If you work hard, I would urge you to do it. Now, we will get into the idea that he put forward and the lesson in general. Let us start this lesson with a small demonstration of electromagnetic induction. I have a multimeter here. Now it is set to measure volts, particularly millivolts. And I have a coil wound around a plastic cylinder. And the probes of this multimeter are connected to the two ends of the 
coil and this is a speaker magnet which i have extracted from an old speaker using this setup i'm going to demonstrate electromagnetic induction to you if i bring the magnet close to the coil then you can see that the volt meter reading would change and if i take the magnet away from the coil then also the voltmeter reading will change if i bring the magnet to stop even though it is close to the coil the voltmeter reading will still be zero meaning that the voltage or what is called as electromotive force is produced only when the magnet is in motion only when the magnetic field lines change which go through the coil change and when the magnet is not in motion the voltmeter reading will not change and there is another thing that i want you to observe when i move the magnet in one direction if the reading is positive here it's a positive number here then if i move the magnet in the opposite direction then the reading would be negative for example when this magnet is brought towards the coil if this reading is positive when i take the magnet away from the coil the reading will be negative i want you to observe that so i am taking this magnet look at this zero now i am moving you see it's changing you also saw the negative number it has become zero now i am going to take it away from this notice that i get a positive number now i stopped so it is zero i bring it here again negative and then zero because i stopped it here then when i take it away then it is positive when i bring it it's negative when i take it away it's positive some number you can see that there is a voltage which is generated between the two ends of this coil and when i stop then it becomes zero when i move then it changes but then when i stop it it becomes zero again when i bring it closer then it changes one is negative the other one is positive likewise if i change the side of the magnet now you notice when i bring it closer now this will be positive so it's a positive number but when i take it away notice it's a negative number so if one was north pole this was a south pole notice here i am taking it away now it is negative i am bringing it closer taking it away zero taking it away negative bringing it closer positive taking it away negative bring it closer positive i turn the side now got the magnet now zero when i take it away notice it's positive bring it negative take it away positive bring it negative so this i demonstrated with this small coil i will use another coil like this it's much bigger in the sense that like there are many, many more turns in this coil it's actually a, a sonometer ac coil um but it's the same as this in the sense that like a wire has been wound around uh this cylinder and there may even uh, be a, a core in it okay so these are the two ends of that coil so what i'm going to do i'm going to remove this i'm going to put those things here you can see the coil because there is a paper which is covering it okay but otherwise it's the same the coil is inside trust me this coil inside but there is a paper which is around it if you take that paper then you will be able to see the coil but anyway i'm not going to tamper with it 
and we have just put those two pro probes this is one end of the coil that's the other end of the coil now i put the probes there now notice here then you will see something greater now you see now you see like because there are more turns in this the emf generated is much more now see i stop then it comes to kind of zero now when i take it away then it changes in 9.6 volts now it's become zero and i bring it here then same thing it becomes zero almost i hope i'm not changing so i take this now i'm changing the side of this magnet it's zero now i move it away not zero see much more because there are more turns in this coil and probably a core too so many more so if i do it faster you see we got even 27 there if we move it slowly it levels in so i'm going to Move it, move this way faster. Note is now. I'm going to move this way faster. See, I'll move it faster. Thirty-six. Bring it zero. Then I'll move it again faster. And see, the positive negative keeps changing. So this is a, a small demonstration of electromagnetic induction. So before we do anything else, let's talk about what is called as a magnetic flux. Now this is a very important idea, and this idea is going to be used throughout. this lesson so we'll talk about this first the magnetic flux is defined pretty much the same way the electric flux was defined in your electricity lessons so how did we define the electric flux we said there are electric field lines okay and then the electric field lines talk about electric flux there are electric field lines going in this direction e and if there is a if there is an area let's say that if this is the area this is the area if we take this area and if we want to find the amount of flux passing through this area so what we did was that we took the direction of the normal action this is this is what you call as the area vector okay it you took the area vector the area vector a is nothing but the magnitude of the area and the normal to that area so this was the area vector okay so we so the way we defined electric flux was that phi e is equal to the e vector the electric field intensity vector dot its area vector and that was actually equal to e dot a into the normal vector so this was going to be e a cos theta where theta is the angle between the area vector and the the field vector so this was a scalar quantity we saw that too again depending on uh, the angle theta it can be a positive quantity or a negative quantity but it's a scalar quantity we are going to something similar to the magnetic flux too let's suppose that this is the direction of the external field the magnetic field b and if you want to find the magnetic flux which gives you the amount of uh, a measure of the amount of field lines the field lines themselves are imaginary the amount of field lines which go through this area so let me imagine the area again so this is the area so the area will have a vector again this area vector which is perpendicular to this area if this is the angle theta between the field line and 
the area vector, then the flex through that area, the flex, the magnetic flex phi B through that area can be defined as B dot A. Then that boils down to B dot A magnitude and then the normal vector to that area. So that gives you again B A cos theta. So that's phi B. You notice that phi E and phi B are similar. So the magnetic flex is defined this way. So the amount of field lines which go through a particular area is called as a magnetic flex. So suppose I have an irregular area. Let's say I have, uh, you know, uh, the field lines are like this. Suppose the field lines are like that. Now I have an irregular area like that. Something like this. So this is going to be my irregular area. So we want to find out the amount of flux which is going to go through the area. Then what I will do is that I will take a local area and this is going to be my DA. And this, uh, this local area will have an angle say maybe theta 1 here. Okay. Again I will take something else here, this area. This is again D, and this may have an angle theta 2, you know, uh, with respect to this. In this case, because it is written this, this will be my theta. So this is actually parallel here. Okay. So parallel to the field line. So here theta 2 could be 0. Theta 2 could be 0 again. This could be some other angle. So what I do is, that I find the flux through this little area, this little area, and all other little areas that make up this big area. And I'm going to find the flux through each little area and I'll add it all up. So I'll do this. The phi b through this area, this big area, is equal to b dot then da. I will call this as DA1, okay, DA1, then DA2, these are vectors, DA1 plus B dot DA2, and so on, so B dot DA, yeah. So I am going to find the flex through each area and I will sum it all up. So then I get the total flex through this area. Nothing, as I said, magnetic flux is nothing but a measure of the amount of field lines which go through a, a given area. So this is how we find the magnetic flux. So this idea is critical and based on this idea only, we will take the lesson forward. So now that we have talked about the magnetic flux, Let's talk about the kind of experiments that Faraday did. He basically did three types of experiments. The first type is something like this. He took a coil and then he connected a galvanometer to that. And uh, what he did was he took a magnet and then he brought the magnet towards the coil. So the magnet will have its own field lines. He'll come back and and end on the other side. So let me. So this is the this is the setup. So you have 
you have a coil connected to a gallium armature, so now it's closed. Okay, and now you have a, a magnet, you bring it towards the coil. Let's say like this is how you move it. Then what happened was that the gallium meter showed a deflection, which means that current was flowing in the circuit. Now you have a closed circuit. So the a certain amount of current was flowing in this circuit. And when he took the magnet away from the coil, then also there was a deflection in the galvanometer, but it was in the opposite direction. And when we switch the poles, when he had south here and the north on the other side, and when he brought the magnet close to the coil, then also he saw deflections. But this time, the directions of the galvanometer deflections were reversed. If it deflected this way, when the north pole was brought here, when you brought the south pole, it deflected the other way. So when you, if the coil deflected the other way, the north, north pole was taken away. Now when the south pole is taken away, then it, the coil deflected this way. And when we stopped moving the magnet, there was no deflection at all. Even though the magnet was very close, you know the field is close. It there was no deflection at all in the galvanometer. And not only that, he held the magnet stationary and he moved the coil towards the magnet. Then also the same thing was happening. So he concluded that the current is flowing in the circuit whenever there is a, a relative motion between the magnet and the coil. Either you move the coil or, the, or move the magnet towards the coil or away from the coil and whenever there is a relative motion between these two then there is a current flowing in the circuit. So that was the first conclusion we made. The second experiment, type of experiment that he did was this. He had the same coil and then connected to the galvanometer. So you have a coil here. Now instead of a magnet, he used another coil. Now he passed a steady current through that coil with the help of a, a battery. So we know that a current carrying coil will behave like a magnet. So he has replaced a bar magnet with an electromagnet now. So when he brought this coil towards this coil, the original coil, he was able to observe the same effect. So this coil did not care whether the magnetic field was produced by this one, a bar magnet, or a permanent magnet, or by a, uh, an electromagnet. So as long as there was this magnetic field and that was changing, the field strength is changing. That's very obvious, right? So when the magnet is at a particular position, then you have a particular field strength here. And when you bring the magnet closer, the magnetic field strength is changing. Or you can say that the number of lines that go through this, that changes. As you bring the magnet closer, then th there will be more number of lines which will go through this. And when you take them away, again there will be less number of lines that will go through this. But then there is a change in the magnetic field strength. The same thing is happening here. So this will also produce a magnetic field. So like that, so the field will be like this. Something like this, it will go like 
that. Finally, same thing happens. So you have this magnet, electromagnet. So if you bring it closer, then pretty much the effect that you had with this magnet is happening here. So that it also produced a, a current. And when you took it away, then the current was flowing in the opposite direction. And this is the second type of experiments that is. So from these two experiments, he was able to conclude two things. One, this coil did not care about the nature of the magnetic field. It could be produced either by a bar magnet or an electromagnet. It doesn't matter. But as long as the magnetic field value was changing and it was producing an electric current in the circuit, because it's a closed circuit. So you're not connecting a voltmeter, you're connecting a galvanometer, which is pretty much like closing the circuit. So it was sending the current. So the current was produced in this. As long as there was relative motion between these two. Then the third type of experiment that he did, something different. This time, what he did was, he took the same coil, connected to the galvanometer, and then he took another coil like that, which is connected to a battery. This time you have a key. Okay, so this is battery and this is the key. This time we did not move the coils. The coils are stationary now. Now you have a key. Right now there is no current flowing in the circuit. So this is not a magnet yet. Now you close the key. If you close the key, then the current rises from zero to the steady state value I in this coil. When there was this rise, there was a momentary deflection. So it started from zero and then it went to I. When it was doing that, when you switched it on, then there was this momentary deflection. And once you started passing the steady current, then there was no deflection at all. Because they are not moving. In these two cases, they are moving. But in this case, the third case, you are not moving it at all. But once you close the switch, then there was a momentary deflection. And when the steady current is flowing, there is no deflection of the galvanometer as can expect, that there is no motion between these two co coils. And we switch it off again, so you take it again. Okay. Let me remove this. That's it. You open the switch. Then what happens? The current will go from I to zero. So there is a change in current. Which means that there is a change in the magnetic field at this position. So when I was flowing, it would have some amount of magnetic field strength. Now it is going from that value to zero. So this field strength is changing from that value to zero. So there is a field, the magnetic flex now, it is changing from some value to zero. Now there is a momentary deflection. So when the field was changing, for whatever duration, there was a deflection. Whether you switch it on or switch it off. But when the field was not changing, there was no deflection at all. So these are the three types of experiments that Faraday did to come to a conclusion. From these experiments, Faraday gave us a law which is called as the Faraday's law. The law states that the magnitude of the EMF which is generated in a circuit is equal to the time rate of change of magnetic flux through that circuit. Let me say it again. The magnitude of the EMF generated in a circuit is equal 
to the time rate of change of magnetic flux through that circuit. In this law, I want to talk about the term EMF. E M F. This is an acronym for electromotive force. Electro motive force. So he says that the magnitude of the EMF. The magnitude of the electromotive force is equal to the time rate of change of magnetic flux through the circuit. But suddenly, like, why do you talk about force? We have been talking only about current. Why does it even come in? Actually, the term EMF is not force. It is not referring to force. Even though you have electromotive force as a name, this is not about force. This is actually the potential difference, the voltage. You call this as force, but it is not a force. It is potential. Difference, voltage. Then why should we talk about voltage now? You, we were talking only about current, the deflection of the galvanometer. Suddenly, why are you talking about the voltage? You should say current, right? Why are you talking about voltage? Well, that is because for the same setup, for the same magnetic uh, field spin and, uh, uh, and the same speed with which you move towards away from the coil, and for the same number of turns of the coil, if you change, and same dimensions of the coil, if you change the material with which you are making the coil, then the current through the galvanometer would be different. So what I mean by that is, with the same dimensions, same number of turns, same circumference, like area, everything is the same. But if you make the coil with copper, then if you move the magnets in the same way, I'll get one amount of current in this. If I use aluminium for the same thing, then another amount of current. And iron, another amount of current. Silver, another amount of current. So depending on the material, the current which is flowing through the material would be different if everything else remains the same. Same number of turns, same dimensions same magnetic moment for this magnet and the same speed with which you approach same everything is same but then the current would be different why it is because of the resistance offered by different materials because it's a closed circuit so the resistance would be different in different materials but in all materials the voltage generated because of this motion will be the same. Though the materials can be different, because of this motion, the voltage generated in this will be the same. The current would be different because of the resistance of the material. And that is why Faraday talks about electromotive force, which is not a force, because he did not know. It is actually potential. But this name is stuck to this phenomenon and we are also stuck with that name. We will keep using the name electromotive force but any and every time we use this name we are not referring to force, we are referring to potential, we are referring to voltage. I want you to remember that. EMF does not mean force, it means voltage. So the voltage generated in a circuit is equal to the time rate of change of the magnetic flux through the circuit and that is Faraday's law.
a deeper understanding of it is this i have this magnet it's an optical pole it's optical pole and i i pick a point in space this is a point so i have this magnet here for this magnet at this point there is a magnetic field strength right it will be some tesla i might have some gauss some tesla i have some magnet. but if you bring it closer you notice that at the same point the magnetic field strength is changing because i bring this magnet so there is a change in the magnetic field that flex through that point so i can conclude that there is an emf there is a voltage there is an electric field generated there even in free space how do i test it well i say that there is this potential how do i test it there is an electric field i'm saying how do i test it well we put an electron there or bring a conductor there if we bring a conductor it has free electrons and those electrons will start moving why are they moving they are moving because there is this potential there is this field set up by this this change in magnetic flux even if the conductor is not there then the electric field is going to be there generated field is going to be there so the electric field does not depend on the conductor because you have the conductor you can measure it you can you can get current out of it because electrons the free electrons will start moving but even if the conductor is not there if we move this magnet at this point there is an electric it's a deeper understanding of faraday's law but for the moment this will hold out i have an electric circuit i have a magnet and if i there is a relative motion between the circuit and the magnet then there will be an emf generated and that emf is equal to the time rate of change of magnetic flux mathematically i will say the emf generated is equal to d phi p is magnetic flux change by dt this is what faraday says the faraday says this. but later A German scientist Lenz comes along and then he puts a negative sign here. Why we will see a little later. But this is the mathematical representation of Faraday's law. The EMF induced in an electric circuit is equal to the time rate of change. of magnetic flux through that circuit the negative sign why is it important why is this negative sign important you didn't even talk about it but why is it important think about it i have the coil this two ends now i bring a magnet north south So if you bring the magnet here, and clearly there's a flux changing, and there is going to be an EMF induced. What is EMF? Potential. If there is a potential difference, then out of this and this, which one is positive and which one is negative? Is this positive or is this positive? And that sign, which is positive? Yeah, five volts is fine. Suppose five volts are getting generated. Five volts, that's fine. but which is positive and which is negative how do you know that you know that through this sign by negative sign so this is a contribution from lens but faraday talks only about the the magnitude of the emf induced but this is a mathematical representation of faraday's law after lens put a negative sign there okay so this is faraday's law mathematical form
como Faria. Well, this is for one loop. Okay? It's for one loop. But what if the coil has n loops, n terms? So each loop, each conductor, right? Each conductor will undergo this. So what, what is happening to one conductor, uh, one section of the conductor will keep happening for the other loop too, right? Because it's changing every way. So if one loop produces a certain voltage, V and the next loop will produce the same and then the next loop will produce the same. So you see and they are connected in series so you notice that V, V, V or X, E, 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 E will get added and finally if I take one end and the other end then I have got the E is added up. So I will say that if the coil has n turns and that's going to be very law for that is going to be minus n d phi b by dt. This is for one term, this is for n terms. Because each term will experience this and they are connected in series. So there is, it is like connecting batteries in series. There is an E, there is an E. There is an E, there is an E. So all these E's will get added and finally you will get a much bigger voltage from the top to the bottom. From one end to the other end of the coil. So if you want to generate more voltage, then if we increase the number of turns for the same magnet and for the same speed with which I move, then I can generate a bigger voltage. And if I close this, this voltage will be sending current. If I don't close it like this, if I leave it open like that, there is no current clearly, but there will be a potential. There is a potential difference generated here between these two points. There is it's a voltage here. There is an EMF here. But there is no current right now. But if I close this, then current will start flowing. And that is what we did here. With using a galvanometer. Hope this is clear to you.